this will be about the first year review of thermochemistry uh, worksheet. I am particularly concerned about this area because this was the first unit that you would have learned during quarantine. And by the admission of some current students, Many didn't take it very serious because of this concept that grades could not be lowered. And so if you were in good standing with your grade, you were, let's just say, less than motivated at this time. However, we need to get this background strong. So this one making a video about a review worksheet. The other thing that can help you is I've given everybody access to my Google Classroom from last year. And if there's an area that you find to be a problem, please go to that, find that lesson. And if you need help, let me know, I'll help, help you find it. Um, and get yourself up to speed because even in a normal year, this is a challenging section. So if your background is weak, it's going to be especially uh, rough on you. So you might have to go through this worksheet and this video a couple of times. Let's start with these terms up here, delta H, delta S, and delta G. Now, delta H, the correct word is enthalpy, but I say just think heat so that it matches up. Delta S is entropy but just think sloppy, so it matches up. The more entropy, the more chaos, the more sloppy. And delta G, just think go. Now it stands for Gibbs free energy, but we mainly use it in this class to tell us whether a reaction is ready to happen, whether it will happen or not. The phrasing of that becomes important and I'll talk about that later regarding what that means. So entropy is an interesting concept regarding question one. It is how much chaos a system has. And in this 1A, if you have equal amounts, a gas is of course more chaotic. So that's more entropy. 1B, if you have the same amount of gas, one is in five liters and one is in 10 liters, this is more subtle, but the 10 liters is considered more chaotic because it's more spread out. That one's a little bit tricky. And then with all else being equal, more stuff is more chaos. And number two is referring to two things that reactions are trying to accomplish. So I often say that nature is trying to do two things as reactions occur. It's trying to lower the energy, so you want a negative delta H, and it's trying to raise the entropy, so you want a positive delta S. If you have a reaction and it meets both of these criteria, this type of reaction will be a successful reaction. It will happen. Likewise, if you have the opposite of these two, you can say this reaction will not occur under the current conditions, it's not gonna happen. If you have one of these and not the other one, like let's say you have negative here and you also have a negative here. In this case, this is where the delta G calculation comes in. You calculate delta G and it will tell you whether it's ready to go or not, because you just can't tell otherwise. Okay, number three, if you flip an equation, what happens to delta H? The sign gets flipped and this comes back to a concept called Hess law. And pretty much what it says is, whatever you do to a reaction, you do to delta H. So if you double a reaction, you double delta H. If you reverse a reaction, then you flip the sign. So you do negative the delta H. If the delta H is always negative, you get a double negative, which of course becomes a positive. All right, number four here. Thermochemical equation just means to put the heat 
with the reaction. It sounds fancier than it is. There's two ways to do that. One way is to put the heat into the equation. So if it was endothermic, you would write the heat over here as a reactant. And if it's exo, you could write it over here as a product. My preferred method is unless you're asked to put it in the reaction, I like to use what's called delta H notation in which you just write it off to the side. So the combustion of butane, C4H10, unless there's something special, combustion will always be reacting with oxygen, making carbon dioxide and water. There are other cases. This is not the only possibility, but this is the typical possibility. Balance the reaction. It says the amount of heat given off, okay, given off, that's where I get the negative from, right there. I made a big deal out of it on my sheet. It was 875 kilojoules per mole. So 875 kilojoules. And you'll see when I show um, one of the lessons, I'm gonna talk about this unit and different ways of expressing this and what's acceptable and why. <laughs> In this case, a person reading this reaction, they would say, okay, one of these is reacting with 13 halves or 6.5 of these oxygens, four CO2 will get produced, five H2O will get produced, and 875 kilojoules of heat will be produced in this case. Now that we have heat with the reaction, you can think of it as part of the stoichiometry. So what I have in red here, the one 13 half, four, five, and negative 875 kilojoules, those are all equivalent values. So you can use it as a stoichiometry problem and that's what number five is. I've got the grams of C4H10, which is called butane. Grams to moles like usual. And then it's asking how much heat is given off. Well, the stoichiometry says for every one of these right here, that's where I get my one, I get this much heat. And so there's my heat here. That gives me negative 15.0 kilojoules of heat. Now the negative is the same thing as saying given off or produced or exothermic. You could have written 15.0 kilojoules given off if you wanted. That means the same thing, but I prefer the negative. It just makes it fast. Moving along. Number six. Um, <clears throat> based on the same situation, how many grams of oxygen <clears throat> reacted if 45 kilojoules were given off? So I'm just starting with something else. So here's my 45 kilojoules. I put the negative here, but you don't really do anything with it. <clears throat> um, I mean, technically the negative here and here cancels, but you were just comparing amounts. So it's not critical right now. I get the 6.5 from the balanced reaction. I got the 875 kilojoules from the balanced reaction and then moles to grams like usual to get me my grams of oxygen. Now in seven, I say to do a thermochemical equation again, but this time I say to put the heat into the equation. This is the other version that, like I mentioned, I don't typically prefer, but you should know how to do it. Um, heat of formation. Okay, let's take a moment and talk about reactions. I'm gonna go give me some more space here. You should know that the typical combustion reaction is gonna be some kind of fuel plus oxygen will form CO2 and water, as mentioned earlier. The fuel might take different states. It could be a gas, liquid, or solid. The oxygen will be a gas, the CO2 will be a gas, the water will mainly be a gas, but sometimes um, you might actually see it written as liquid. And you've experienced this. This happens whenever you do a lab with the Bunsen burners, 
we're doing this type of reaction. And what's happening is the Bunsen burners are making a bunch of water vapor. And you might notice that the room gets a bit humid on lab days because the AC has a hard time keeping up with all that moisture being created. Now on to what caused me to think of this situation is you also need to know how to write a formation reaction. And when you write a formation reaction, you need to form the chemical of interest. So whatever you're being told to form from its elements. And this word elements is critical, critical. Make sure you do the elements. Don't use molecules, don't use ionic compounds. It has to be from its elements. So if the chemical you're making has iron, you would start with iron. If the chemical has carbon, you would start with carbon. There's one special case, and those are the diatomic molecules. So if it needs oxygen, you would do O2. If it needs chlorine, you would do Cl2. And to remind you, the diatomic molecules never have fear of ice cold beer is the college version. The high school version is icy clear breath. So whichever phrase you want to know, but as long as you know these seven diatomic molecules are the only molecules you use, everything else must be from its elements. So if we go back to this example, the formation of calcium sulfate, okay, we'll start with what you're forming, write that first as a product, because that's what we're doing. Then think, what are the elements? Well, calcium, sulfur, and oxygen, diatomic, and then balance it. Where a lot of students tend to mess this problem up is they'll get calcium, and they'll go, oh, I know what sulfate is, and they'll write sulfate, and then they'll form the chemical. That is not a formation reaction. That's a different reaction. So formation, you cannot use polyatomic ions. It's gotta be elements and diatomics. Uh, I said that it made negative 1433 kilojoules per mole. That means you can assume per mole of calcium sulfate. And so since this is an automatic one right here, we're safe just to pop this over here at the product. Of course, the order doesn't matter. If you want on the right side of the arrow, you can put the 1433 kilojoules first and then the calcium sulfate. The order is not critical as long as they're both on the right side. Notice because I have put it as a product, I don't need to put the negative. Saying it's a product is the same thing as saying it's a negative if I were to write it off to the side like this. Those mean the same thing. Uh, if reaction's exothermic, which would have a higher enthalpy? Okay, well, enthalpy is the heat going in or out of the reaction. So if it's exothermic, heat is going out. That means heat is leaving the system and going to the environment. So the thing with more enthalpy must have been the reactants. And um, we did some drawings like this. They're often referred to as a reaction energy profile in which the reactants are starting here. They're that line on the left, products are here. And if it's exothermic, your product line is always gonna be lower like I've drawn it. And so this shows that the enthalpy change would have been from this line down there like that. So it would have been that change. And you can see that the products are lower, reactants are higher. This path, this hill, we'll talk about more later on. And that would be the energy of the reaction as it occurs. 
Delta H does not care about what the hill looks like. It only cares where do you start and where do you end. The hill is a whole different discussion. All right, number nine, uh, heat of formation for iron three oxide. So again, write what you're forming first, then put your arrow and then think, what are the elements? Well, iron, oxygen, and then balance it. Now, it's important to note this value is per mole. It is per mole of iron three oxide. It should be Fe2O3. So you have to keep this one right here. Must keep that one for this energy value to be relevant because it's per mole of that chemical. So when you go to balance your oxygen, a three halves makes sense. Now at this point, students say, well, what, what if I wanted to not use the three halves? What if I wanted to do four irons and three oxygens and make two Fe2O3? You can do that, but you'd have to be aware this two Fe2O3 means that your delta H would have to be double. So you'd have to multiply your value times two <clears throat> to make it match this reaction. And typically it's easier, just leave the product as a one and then just do fractions you could do 1.5 if you prefer that instead of three halves. All right, 10, determine if a reaction will happen if the delta H is negative 157 and delta S at 25, um, because the temperature will affect whether reactions will happen, is 0.675 kilojoules per mole degrees Celsius. This is saying, based on this condition, 25 degrees Celsius, and the particular delta H for this reaction, and the delta S for the reaction, will it occur? And so that's where you use this equation. I call this the master equation because it's very profound. It tells you whether things will occur or not, and you can figure out whether the reaction is a decent reaction without even having to do it. You can just do it on paper. And this is quite a powerful tool for engineers and scientists and so on. Rather than just trying everything, they can predict what will and what will not work. Equations, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. In this case, here's my delta H. Here's my delta S. Here's my temperature. Now notice this particular example, both my delta S and my temperature in Celsius. So since they match, we're good to go. Usually delta S is usually in Kelvin. So the typical unit is gonna be some number and then kilojoules per mole times Kelvin. So you usually have to convert to Kelvin. So be aware of that. This one just happened to be nice and not make you do that. In this case, we get a negative value and a negative delta G means that the reaction is good to go. Sometimes people say that it is spontaneous. There's other phrasings that come up. Um, the value can give some indication as to how aggressive the reaction is, but there are other factors that go into it. So you can't say with certainty just based on this. But the fact that it's negative, it's a yes. This reaction is good. Had it been positive, it would have been <clears throat> no. A no doesn't mean the reaction will never happen. It just means it's not gonna happen under the current conditions. And I'm gonna stop this here. And then I'll make a second video for the rest of the worksheet, just so it's not too, um, too long.